Lord of Mysteries 2, Circle of Inevitability. Chapter 526, Resolution. The destination was Demon Warlock Berman's next target. Without waiting for Lumian's response, the adventurer mumbled to himself in puzzlement, Are you a blessed of luck? No, a blessed of calamity, Lumian replied inwardly. As thoughts raced, Batna suddenly formulated a new hypothesis. Could this be Demon Warlock Berman himself? He had investigated the explosion scene, returning to flaunt his prowess at the crime scene, and blindfolded himself to randomly choose the next victim. Such an explanation seemed far more plausible than being blessed with luck. Lumian glanced at Batna's Batna's tense expression and smiled. Don't tell me you think I'm Berman? How long have I been in Port Farum? That's exactly it. Something happened the night you first arrived in Port Farum, Batna didn't dare vocalize it. When the courtier desk black pearls exploded, I was still praying in the cathedral, Lumian said with amusement, providing an alibi. Batna pondered for a moment and relaxed, but confusion still lingered on his face. Lumian sighed and inquired, Yesterday, I didn't expect to encounter anything related to the demon warlock while walking blindfolded. I just found it fun. He spoke the truth. However, he couldn't shake the suspicion that the corruption caused by Zeozin One might be more severe than he had imagined. Of course, he couldn't rule out the possibility that Trier, a seal from the fourth epoch, had effectively suppressed the pre-existing issues within him. The excuse of finding it fun barely convinced Batna. He felt that Louis Berry was undoubtedly such a person. Yet, the other party would sporadically set traps just for the amusement of it. Anyone treating him as an idiot would end up becoming one. Perhaps I was truly blessed by luck yesterday, Lumian concluded. Lumian's reasoning convinced Batna that Demon Warlock Berman's continuous evasion and access to resources stemmed from his close symbiotic relationship with Fidel, a prominent merchant. The subsequent tragedy likely resulted from the pressure exerted by the official Bayonder's investigation, leading to internal strife. What a shame, Batna sighed. If I had sold the clues about the Demon Warlock's close connection to Fidel to the authorities beforehand, I could have bagged a hefty bounty. It would have been at least 5,000 Verldor, Batna shook his head. No, without evidence, the authorities won't buy it. Can't tell them we stumbled on clues blindfolded, blessed by luck. They just cuff us for being fraudsters. A chuckle slipped from Lumian's lips. Can't you fabricate some evidence to back the clues? Say you spotted someone suspicious at Fidel's back door, maybe the demon warlock. Let the official Bayonders confirm it themselves. They'll uncover the truth in due time. T that'd work? Batna's mouth hung slightly agape. Why not? Lumian grinned. If you truly found the demon warlock, tell them not to sweat the details. Just ask if the clues are legit and if they helped capture the demon warlock. If they miss Berman, it's a small scam at worst. Few days of hard labor for you. Official Bayonders can take tips from adventurers without solid certainty, right? They'd miss genuine info otherwise. Lumian's words left Batna silent momentarily before he blurted out, Don't tell me you've got Islander blood. Deception seemed to be his forte. Lumian casually replied, New an Islander in Trier, quite the con artist with rich experience and techniques. With a flicker of interest, Lumian raised his left hand, pinching his left eye socket. Glancing at Batna, he asked, How long have you been adventuring? Why still so green? Over a year, Batna defended himself. It's just that I stick to the rules with authorities. I'm more adaptable when dealing with pirates and others. Adventurers slipping clues to authorities also dabble in deceit, right? Lumian grinned. They scam if they can. He suspected Batna's strict adherence to rules came from a well-bred background, a notion confirmed by the other party's attire and appearance. Observing Batna's silence, Lumian finished his remaining salted coffee and glanced back at the lively open-air market. Try not to go to the morgue, cemetery, or other places for the time being. Just as Batna was about to ask why, he instantly grasped the advice's true meaning. Without Fidel to provide resources, the demon warlock might feel compelled to take action. 
Before long, his messenger, Penitent Baneful, emerged from the void and handed him a letter. Franca, based on your latest account and my discussion with those seven last night, I suspect that demon warlock Berman had been compelled to switch sequences. He was originally a warlock, but to revive his wife, he switched to the neighboring death pathway. He went half mad, becoming half human and half monster. Though this could be explained as a warlock receiving an evil god's boon, your situation doesn't align. No cases of Bayonder powers from two pathways fusing and mutating have been documented. This was evident in your clash with Berman. The Eye of Illusory you mentioned has the Eye of Mystery prying, revealing the side of reality, but it also displays the Death Pathway's suppression of the spirit body or even enslavement. As far as I know, the Death Pathway gains an Eye of Death ability at Sequence 8 Gravedigger. Did it fuse with the Eye of Mystery prying, forming that distinctive Eye of Illusory? As Lumian read, he suddenly recalled the appearance of the Eye of Illusory. Embedded vertically in his forehead, illusory and blurry, a deep purple bordering on black, with numerous pale white patterns undeniably a fusion of the Eye of Mystery prying and the Death Pathway's abilities. Lumian's gaze shifted downward as he continued reading. White feather like fur, decaying wounds, control over various undead creatures, unstable emotional states, and extreme actions all indirectly confirming my hypothesis. The origins of the old blood are rather peculiar. I've conducted magic mirror divination several times and consulted various entities, but all I've gleaned is that it stems from the depths of the spirit world. No further information. It seems the irreversible half-mad Berman had some other fortuitous encounter. Unstable emotions, extreme actions, irreversible half-madness, Lumian mulled over the descriptions and let out an inaudible sigh. How determined and desperate must Berman have been when he chose to consume the Death Pathway potion? Wild Bayonders didn't know they could switch to neighboring pathways at a specific sequence. They believed once a divine pathway was chosen, it couldn't be altered. Forced consumption of potions from other pathways led to madness or death. Moreover, Mystery Prior and Death weren't adjacent pathways that allowed switching. Berman wouldn't have drunk the Death Pathway potion without a resolve bordering on death, all to revive his wife, even at the cost of his sanity. Lumian sensed he might have made the same choice in such a situation, hence his conflicting emotions. Franca's letter ended with reassurance. Don't fret over the aftermath. Berman's mental state will soon cause him to resurface without Fidel's support and restraint. He might succeed once or twice in gathering materials for experiments, but it won't last. Official Bayonders will eliminate him within weeks or even days. Lumian glanced at Penitent Baneful, yet to depart. Help me deliver my reply to the sender. Swiftly, he penned a line, I'll kill Berman as soon as possible. Before long, Penitent Baneful returned with Franca's reply, Why? Lumian wrote on the same piece of paper, I wish to punish him for his crimes. He paused for a moment before continuing and end his pain. Folding the letter into a square, Lumian handed it to Baneful and glanced at the messenger. Don't you find it troublesome to send letters back and forth? It wasn't concern but puzzlement. After delivering the letter, Penitent Baneful didn't leave immediately. Instead, he waited for a potential reply. This time, Baneful didn't remain silent. He replied in a deep voice, Being busy makes me feel better. It's better to have something to do than always watch the darkness. Lumian listened quietly without responding, watching penitent Baneful turn and walk into the void. He empathized with those words. Franca didn't stop Lumian. Her reply was concise and forceful, Be careful. Few, Lumian exhaled and walked to the living room window, casting his gaze at Port Ferrum bathed in the blazing sunlight and the distant Andatna volcano. Chapter 527 Immersion Under the sunlight, Port Ferrum appeared to be tinged with a golden hue, and the air seemed to carry the sweetness of cane sugar. Lumian lingered by the window, contemplating the whereabouts of the demon warlock. During his rescue the previous night, Berman had slipped into a deep coma, 
unable to direct the undead creature he controlled. Therefore, the undead being must have relied on its instincts and routines to transport Berman to a safe haven he frequented. Ordinarily, Fidel's residence would be his top choice. Yet, when Lumian scoured the premises, there were no traces indicating Berman's return. His initial assumption was that Berman had employed the undead creatures to eliminate Fidel's family, attendants, and servants. Recognizing 16 Rue Koreas as a battlefield and unsafe, they likely sought an alternate hideout. Where could that be? From his traveler's bag, Lumian retrieved the information Franca had provided about Berman and the rest of the details gathered from Philip, Batna, and the others. He read through it again, attempting to immerse himself in the mindset of the demon warlock, simulating his thoughts, actions, and motivations. Berman hailed from Fog Province, also known as Winter Province, situated in the northern part of Antis. Bordering the Faisak Empire, the region had relatively rustic folk customs, with a penchant for strong liquor. His wife, Helen, a Port Farum native without islander heritage, had a grandfather who worked as a cane sugar merchant traveling between Port Farum and Port Lesur. Unfortunately, he encountered pirates, losing most of his business and relying on a plantation he had previously acquired. Born and raised on that plantation, Helen witnessed its sale due to conflicts among her father's generation after her grandfather's death. Her family received a portion of the money and relocated to Port Farum. After her father's passing and her mother falling ill, she became an adventurer and crossed paths with Berman. Both had experienced fortuitous encounters during their adventures, gaining superpowers. They even acquired property in Port Farum, planning a future away from the adventurous life as they grew older. Several years ago, they, along with a group of fellow adventurers, rented a boat to explore the seas for treasure. Unfortunately, they encountered sea monsters, and only Berman and two others survived. Following this tragic incident, Berman's attempts to revive his wife took a progressively desperate turn. Treasure hunting at sea? Are there really that many treasures at sea? Lumian mumbled, convinced that it was highly likely Berman was still in Port Farum. This place held his dearest memories, remnants of the years spent with his wife Helen. When selecting a hiding spot, he would instinctively lean towards this area. With this in mind, Lumian continued reading the latter part of the intel. As anticipated, Berman's past dangerous experiments had unfolded near the Fog Sea Archipelago, encompassing other islands and the villages and towns along the northern continent's coast. If he connected them into irregular concentric circles, the center would be in Port Farum on St. Tick Island. Berman uses Port Farum as a base for resurrection attempts in various places. Lumian pondered. He hasn't stirred trouble in Port Farum before, so why the exception this time? If I were Berman in his half-mad state, I'd treat Port Farum as my spiritual home, a haven of beautiful memories. Typically, I wouldn't disrupt the order here. I might even secretly maintain it and handle some audacious pirates and adventurers on the sly. Lumian analyzed thoughtfully. He had substituted Port Farum with Cordu, Believing that if his sister's death had no connection to Cordu and the peace remained, anyone daring to disturb Cordu's daily life and alter the situation would be his enemy. Frowning slightly, he sensed there might be crucial details unclear about the previous night's explosion. There could be a reason why Berman killed Fidel and his family beyond a mere disagreement. Fidel, having collaborated with Berman for years, should have known about his unstable mental state. How could such a shrewd merchant not consider the potential repercussions of his words on the demon warlock? Moreover, Berman aimed to eliminate the adventurer Louis Berry to conceal his collaboration with Fidel. If Fidel was already dead, why silence Lumian? Perhaps Fidel had assumed he could persuade Berman to wait a few days before acting, only to find Berman already in a deranged state driven by instinct. After careful consideration, Lumian decided to re-enter Port Farum and visit Berman and Helen's former residence. Even though Berman had sold it long ago to fund his resurrection experiments and it was under official Bayonder scrutiny, there remained a possibility of discovering crucial clues. What if the mad Berman insisted on returning to his previous abode? Instructing Lugano to keep an eye on Ludwig, 
Lumian descended to the deck and encountered Philip. The Flying Bird's security supervisor regarded Lumian with a mixed expression. Without mentioning the room that seemed to have been bombarded by cannons, he stated, I'll distribute the remaining repair fees to the participating workers and attendants. The implication was clear. I've already compensated those who need to be silenced. You can take a share yourself, Lumian replied with a smile. Philip shook his head and sighed. Not having any more incidents like that on the way from Port Ferrum to Port Santa would be the best reward for me. I'll do my best, Lumian sincerely assured him. He refrained from making promises, acknowledging factors beyond his control. He also looked forward to reaching Port Santa without trouble and beginning the hunt for the key members of April Fool's Bard and Ultraman. Philip gazed at Lumian for a few seconds as if contemplating whether to report him in advance. He sighed again. The port lockdown will be lifted tonight. The flying bird will set sail again tomorrow morning. Don't miss it. Lumian nodded and asked curiously, the demon warlock has been apprehended. No, but it's pretty much confirmed that it has nothing to do with the ships at the port. Nor is he hiding here, Philip replied nonchalantly. Berman even killed the prominent merchant Fidel's family last night. They seem to be in a cooperative relationship. Perhaps Fidel wanted to betray him. At this point, Philip gave Lumian a sharp glance. Last night, the battle in your room could it be related to this? What kind of connection do you think there will be? Lumian asked, amused. Philip pondered for a moment and couldn't make the connection. Observing this, Lumian waved his hand and donned his golden straw hat. He descended the gangway to the docks and left the port district. As Lumian reached Sun Square, adorned with numerous wanted posters, he was approached by an islander man with brownish-black skin, sunken eyes, and a deep-set gaze. The man handed him a folded book with a plethora of words and crude patterns printed on it. Traveler, this is Port Farm's travel guide. It lists scenic spots, unique delicacies, and sexual entertainment venues, the islander introduced with zeal. It'll make your stay here more enjoyable. Lumian played along and asked, How much? It's free. I'll give it to you for free. The islander exclaimed in a high-pitched voice. The government prints these for tourists, hoping for a positive impression of Port Ferrum. Awesome. Lumian accepted the guidebook with an expression of pleasant surprise and unfolded it. The guide detailed scenic views and recommendations from various shops, sugar cane outlets, sexual entertainment venues, renowned eateries, and more. Suddenly, Lumian swiftly drew his revolver and pressed it against the islander's forehead. The islander froze, stunned. After a few seconds, he stammered, No, no charge. I'm not lying. Was this minor situation worth a gun being drawn? I'm going to call the police. Lumian smiled and inquired, What's the connection between these recommended shops and you? No, the islander felt the chill of the gun and carefully changed his words. Th they paid us to recommend them. Some of them are owned by our partners. How many are legitimate shops? Lumian pressed undeterred. Ninety percent. Just as the islander finished speaking, Lumian cocked the revolver's hammer, sending a clear message. He hastily added, 90% of them are connected to us. Lumian chuckled, continuing with another question, what about the scenery? 50%. Only the plantations and primitive tribes are connected to us. The islander trembled in fear. Lumian shook the travel guide and smiled at the islander. Show me the real ones. The islander quickly pointed out different parts, worried that the gun might misfire. Only then did Lumian stow away his revolver and take the guidebook to the open-air market on the other side of Sun Square. He had engaged the islander partly to frighten the swindler and partly because a new idea had struck him. For Berman, who had resided in Port Farum for many years, were some of the delicacies and scenery here also part of his cherished memories. During setbacks, when he killed his best partner and faced defeat in battle, would he, driven by madness and paranoia, seek out places with beautiful memories to draw strength and recharge? Lumian believed if he were in Berman's shoes, he would have done the same. 
reason might suggest that he could be tracked and discovered, but half-mad individuals often ignored reason. Therefore, whether it was the moonlit scenery of the lighthouse, the setting sun behind the volcano, repto mince pork, Gasparo seafood rice, or Saint Tick chocolate ice cream, all could attract the covert patronage of the demon warlock. In his current state, there was a high chance that he wouldn't meticulously erase his tracks. Adjusting his golden straw hat, Lumian made his way through the open air market, heading toward the cliff mountain outside Ferrum, where Port Ferrum's lighthouse stood. Chapter 528 Treasure Legend The crash of azure waves echoed against the cliff's base, creating a cascade of white flowers in their wake. Approaching the lighthouse, Lumian pondered its rumored history, a relic left behind by the Intisians upon their arrival at St. Tick Island, his gaze fixating on the distant sea. The night's crimson moonlight, still hours away, refrained from casting its dreamy glow, rendering the scene quiet and undisturbed by tourists. Circling the lighthouse reminiscent of Roselle's era, Lumian observed for nearly fifteen minutes, fruitlessly searching for any sign of the demon warlock. He didn't anticipate a direct encounter with Berman. It wasn't yet the time to admire the moon. Lumian simply sought to discern if Berman would visit to reminisce about the past and his wife after waking up last night, a moment of solace to steady his heart and find the strength to persevere. The lighthouse guardian, with a pipe emitting the aroma of roasted tobacco leaves, offered a friendly reminder, Kid, there's nothing much to see here during the day. It's a whole different story at night. Lumian smiled and inquired, Do people come in the middle of the night? Indeed, the fifty-year-old guardian boasted. Those trier playboys love bringing their dates here to bask in the moonlight. Any mysterious figures, perhaps someone donning a hood and pretending to be a warlock? Lumian pressed on. The lighthouse guardian's face betrayed a nostalgic expression. Sometimes, thought it was a ghostly silhouette a few times. Did such a figure visit late last night? Lumian queried, a subtle curl forming on his lips. There was nothing wrong with his speculation from his immersion. Perhaps his similar experiences allowed him to better understand Berman's mental state and paranoid thoughts. The Guardian replied, Can't say for sure. I didn't see anything. Lumian didn't press further. He decided to return in the early morning hours, the enchanting few hours beneath the moonlight. Over the next three hours, he explored the truly renowned gourmet restaurants in Port Ferrum. Despite asking similar questions, Lumian obtained no valuable information. It became apparent that demon warlock Berman exercised restraint under normal circumstances, avoiding impulsive actions. He seldom frequented crowded places, and when he did, his disguise was impeccable. By 4 p.m., Lumian reached Port Farm's modest steam locomotive station. He spent three Verl door for a ticket bound for the Andatna volcano mine. If he aimed to witness the sunset there, the journey had to commence now. Whoosh! Clunk! 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 The iron black carriage belched thick smoke as it lumbered along the railway sleepers. Gradually, it gained momentum, akin to a colossal giant overcoming inertia and mobilizing its components. Seated by the window, Lumian held a golden straw hat, quietly admiring the vanishing plantations. Shortly before 6 p.m., the train halted outside Andatna's volcanic mine. Adorning his straw hat, Lumian bypassed the mine entrance, opting for a nearby trail leading to the volcano's summit. As the greenery dwindled, grayish-black hues prevailed. Occasional red rocks punctuated the landscape. Without the shelter of foliage, Lumian's vision expanded. The peculiar grandeur of this place seemed to embody the vastness of desolation and silence. Following the tourist-worn grayish-black path, Lumian advanced step by step toward the volcano's mouth, revealing coal-black surfaces with reddish depressions. The temperature inside was notably warmer. Unbridled winds stirred, sending grayish-black gravel airborne, causing human forms to sway. In this spectacle, the nearly setting sun bathed the desolate surroundings in a golden-red glow, intensifying the sunken redness. Pressing down on his straw hat, Lumian ventured two to three hundred meters along the volcano's crater. 
Abruptly, the mountaintop wind subsided and the suspended gravel settled in eerie silence. Lumian immediately spotted a figure standing silently on the grayish-black diagonal wall outside the volcano's crater, bathed in the last radiant sunlight. Cloaked in black robes and a deep hood, the figure attentively watched the gradual descent of the golden-red sun. Lumian's expression remained unchanged as he advanced step by step, refraining from initiating an attack. Sensing Lumian's approach, the hooded figure turned around, unveiling a pale white face marked by decaying wounds and a wide swath of fur. It was none other than demon warlock Berman. Perhaps influenced by the serene scenery and haunting memories, Berman, known for his madness, spoke wearily, You've actually found this place. Lumian, who had been securing his golden straw hat against the strong wind, chuckled self-deprecatingly and responded. If not for my illusions and hope, and if I didn't have numerous enemies awaiting my discovery, I would frequently return to Kordu and the nearest high mountain pasture. The grass there is vividly green, vast and expansive, with pale yellow flowers in full bloom. Countless sheep roam about. The sky mirrors the brilliance of gems, and the occasional drifting white clouds resemble sheep grazing on the ground. At night, the stars emerge, densely packed like diamond gravel at the bottom of a clear river. Standing amidst the blazing sunlight and the vast, silent grayish-black surroundings, Lumian couldn't help but reminisce about Cordu village and the alpine pasture. Berman didn't interrupt. After Lumian finished speaking, he wore a dazed expression and uttered with a smile more pained than joyful. Helen and I thought we could come here to watch the sunset whenever we pleased since it's just a ticket away. But she never came again. And you don't even need to take the steam locomotive, Lumian sighed slowly and said, What happened back then? Berman's face contorted in distortion, the agony evident in his expression. We were deceived. Something was wrong with the treasure map. We encountered real sea monsters. Damn the islanders. Helen always believed they resorted to deceit and thuggery out of necessity. All the respectable positions were held by pure intisions, but we treated them well and placed our trust in them. Yet they colluded with others to betray us for money. I'll kill him, those deceivers, and every islander. Lumian chuckled and remarked, Some of the self-proclaimed noble Tririans are swindlers, while others sell their bodies. I don't generalize against islanders, but I remain cautious of specific individuals. Suddenly, Lumian felt inspired. Was the islander who betrayed you from the marauder pathway? Yes. Berman's face twitched with unrestrained anger. Was it a swindler acting? Lumian asked cautiously. Did he have a tendency to wear monocles or pinch his eye socket? He pointed at his right eye. No. Berman seemed perplexed by Lumian's question. Lumian heaved a sigh of relief. What's his name? Did you manage to kill him? Berman's pale face suddenly flushed and decaying liquid dripped down. His name is Mark Benito. After that incident, he vanished. I never found him. Lumian chose not to provoke Berman further and inquired, Which treasure were you seeking back then? In the depths of the fog sea, there's an island. The inhabitants there don't age or truly die, Berman recalled the treasure rumors he had gathered. There's reason to believe that something incredibly precious is hidden on that island. We didn't want to become enemies with the islanders. Our only hope was to infiltrate the island and steal some ageless medicine. His words were somewhat disorganized, skipping over details. It bears a striking resemblance to the legend of the Fountain of Unaging, Lumian remarked after pondering. The adventurer series has already hinted that the fountain of unaging is a falsehood. Ignoring him, Berman continued, We found some evidence and obtained a treasure map to the island. To our surprise, the map was a forgery. The sea monsters wrecked our ship. In order to allow me to utilize that special witchcraft, Helen stood in front of me. I witnessed her torn into two by the sea monsters. I saw despair in her eyes. Berman panted heavily, unable to continue. And then you switched to the death pathway? Lumian changed the topic. Berman's icy flaxen-colored eyes gleamed. That's correct. Only death, 
who controls the death domain, can bring Helen back. In the treasure legend, many details suggest that only death can achieve eternal life. Understanding the mysteries of death is the key to true resurrection. It's not that the islanders won't die, they can be revived. Do you genuinely believe in that treasure? Lumian already had an answer in mind after posing the question. The partially unhinged Berman clung to every lifeline, trusting every rumor that promised to bring Helen back to life. I do. Berman nodded and spoke with a deep voice, that's because I encountered people from that island some time ago. There really is such an island. There are truly islanders who don't age or truly die. Really? Lumian blurted out. Berman's eyes burned with fanaticism as he declared, I wanted to capture him, but he defeated me. Instead of killing me, he sympathized with my plight and imparted some knowledge about the death domain. There's a way to bring Helen back to life. That cursed swindler. Fidel's attendant is nothing but a swindler. I didn't intend to rush the resurrection ritual. I wasn't fully prepared, but since he's a swindler, I'll kill him. All islanders are swindlers. They all deserve to die. Is he truly from that island, or could he be another swindler? Lumian realized that the incident with the swindler, Roddy, had triggered Berman. There was also the influence of that islander. Lumian narrowed his eyes and inquired, What's the islander's name and what does he look like? Berman suddenly became cautious, scrutinizing Lumian. What brings you here? Observing Berman's reaction, Lumian sighed and, with abnormal composure, said, I'm here to kill you. Berman was taken aback before bursting into laughter. For what? A bounty? Discarding the golden straw hat in his hand, Lumian lowered his body slightly and replied in a deep voice, Punish your sins and put an end to your suffering. Berman ceased his laughter and raised his hands with a cold expression. Bring it on, then. Chapter 529, Irrational His body began to fade, growing more transparent, as if he had transformed into a being from the spirit world difficult for ordinary people to perceive. In the blink of an eye, the demon warlock vanished. Lumian made no move to intervene or evade potential attacks. Calmly, he retrieved the flog boxing gloves adorned with iron black spikes from his traveler's bag and wore them. Completing this preparation, he suddenly knelt on one knee, pressing his hands to the ground. Crimson flames erupted in all directions from Lumian's body, accompanied by a series of explosions. Amidst the rumbling, flames surged, dominating the grayish-black wilderness. Berman's black-robed figure materialized in midair. He slowly floated towards Lumian, narrowing the distance between them. Lumian's figure abruptly vanished, reappearing behind Berman. Spirit World Traversal Without hesitation, Lumian, holding a crimson fireball in his left hand, harumphed. Two beams of white light shot out from his nose, targeting Berman. Floating in midair, Berman didn't lose consciousness as before. His body swayed, forcefully turning around to observe Lumian descending into the sea of flames on the ground. An illusory vertical eye, dark purple and nearly black, materialized between Berman's brows, reflecting Lumian's figure amid pale white patterns. Almost simultaneously, a lanky black shadow emerged from within Berman's body. Nearby, arms made of bones or decayed flesh and pus extended from the void, encircling Berman's transparent and thin form. He hadn't used witchcraft to quietly approach Lumian and strike. Instead, he had clandestinely swapped his spirit with the undead under his command, setting a trap to entice the enemy into deploying that peculiar spell to attack his body. In such a scenario, the absence of one's spirit body meant immunity to abilities targeting the soul body. Berman could then seize the opportunity to use the eye of the spirit to intimidate the enemy and create an opening for the manipulated undead. This time, he refrained from delving deeper into the secret of the other party's spirit body. His goal was to uncover its vulnerabilities, strike with a lethal blow, and absorb the corresponding mystical knowledge. Having suffered greatly from the spell of Harumph the previous night, he had used this ability as a breakthrough from the beginning. Simultaneously, Lumian experienced once again the sensation of his spirit being intimidated and suppressed, as if frozen. 
terrifying arms covered in festering warts or with eyes extended from the void, reaching out for his body. Boom! The explosion's force was mostly mitigated by the flogged boxing gloves, but since they weren't fully covered, the exposed part of Lumian's left palm was turned into a bloody mess. An intense and familiar pain shot through his brain and spirit body, bringing him back to awareness. Seizing this moment of clarity, Lumian activated the black mark on his right shoulder again, vanishing above the sea of flames and disappearing from the strange, undead arms extending from the void. Likewise, he remained vigilant against Berman's eye of illusory. The crimson, nearly white fireball in his left hand was structurally unstable. He had to divert his attention to maintain it, and he couldn't sustain it when affected by the eye of illusory, leading to its natural disintegration and a self-inflicted awakening. If this failed to disrupt the eye of illusory's intimidation, the sea of flames below served as Lumian's second preparation. The residual aura of the Blood Emperor in his right hand was his last resort. Upon vanishing, Lumian reappeared behind Berman once more. Prepared, Berman raised his hands and scattered a tree like powder. Crackling sounds followed as silver-white lightning struck Lumian's head as though a storm ruler had unleashed divine retribution from the sky. For most Bayonders, this would be enough to paralyze and make them tremble incessantly. Yet Lumian showed no such signs, instead he appeared like a reflection in the water shattered by the lightning. The real Lumian was curled up at the bottom of the figure. Berman had struck the phantom created using the niece face. The niece face was essentially an illusion, but it couldn't be cast on others or items. Lumian had to rely on himself, pretending to be a root system with branches and flowers above, forming a derived illusion. There was no fundamental difference between this and using the niece face to make himself taller and bulkier. Amidst the crackling lightning, two crimson fireballs materialized beneath Lumian's feet and behind him. Rumble, the fireball exploded, propelling Lumian towards the levitating Berman. Berman, being close proximity, couldn't dodge the swift Lumian in time. He could only slightly turn his body as a bone spear sprouted from his shoulder, its tip unusually sharp. A grin spread across Lumian's face. He didn't evade, allowing the bone spear to pierce his right chest. With a resounding thud, he swung his left fist, delivering a powerful blow to the side of Berman's face. The demon warlock's head twisted, revealing deep blood-stained, pus-filled holes on his face. His eyes burned with rage, as if he were witnessing the murderer of his wife. The black mark on Lumian's right shoulder emitted a dim light once more. His figure vanished beside Berman, dissolving into the encircling lanky black shadows and other undead creatures, leaving behind the bone spear stained with his blood. The wound on his right chest was grotesque, blood dripping from it. In his hand appeared a dark red bone flute with a hole in it. Symphony of Hatred Lumian brought the bone flute to his lips. As he retreated, he played a mournful and haunting melody. Once again invoking the eye of illusory Berman, who was on the verge of catching up, was frozen in astonishment. Even the undead ceased their movements. Suddenly, blood and pus seeped from Berman's eyes, nose, mouth, and ears, as if a muffled and invisible explosion had occurred within him. His anger, paranoia, and thirst for revenge were fueled by the symphony of hatred. This inflicted a severe blow on him. Lumian refrained from playing the Symphony of Hatred from the outset because Berman differed from other Bayonders. Others needed to identify the problem, but with Berman, there were too many uncertainties. His mental state was extremely unstable, burdened by severe psychological issues. His overwhelming desire to revive his wife and seek revenge on the Islander Swindler was palpable. His body had undergone modifications from the death domain, and Lumian had inflicted significant injuries on him the previous night. There were substantial hidden dangers. Faced with such an adversary, Lumian himself was uncertain about the outcome if he were to unleash the symphony of hatred through the shepherd's flute. It might be manageable if it only triggered desires and emotions, but if Berman's mental state lost even the most basic restraints, the demon warlock could potentially lose control on the spot, transforming into a monstrous entity with mixed abilities. 
such a monster would likely be even more challenging to deal with than Berman. Hence, after the spell of harem failed, Lumian promptly shifted to using flog boxing gloves to kindle Berman's corresponding desires and emotions. This strategic approach increased the likelihood that when Lumian eventually used the Symphony of Hatred, it would exploit the target's emotions and desires, inflicting severe harm. Observing Berman descend into the Sea of Flames amid the eruption of emotions and desires, Lumian executed another spirit world traversal, appearing in front of him in an instant. Bang! 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 He extended his arms, unleashing a relentless barrage of attacks on Berman's body. On the surface of his flog fists, a crimson fireball, almost white, compressed layer by layer. Bam! 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 Flog tore at Berman's flesh like a two-headed python. Rumble! Crimson fireballs erupted around Lumion with no concern for waste. They formed a barrier, preventing the lanky figure, strange arms, and other undead from interfering. One punch, two punches, three punches. Lumian's eyes were fixed on the mangled Berman. At that moment, he reflected on the village destroyed by Berman and the innocent lives lost because of him. How many were beloved wives, waiting husbands, dependent parents, and cherished children? Cordu had been annihilated due to the ambitions of the evil gods. What about the innocent? Lumian's eyes gradually turned crimson as he clenched his fists, this time, he didn't empathize with Berman. Instead, he placed himself in the village he had destroyed and the lives he had taken. Wasn't Cordu like this back then? The ambitions of these evil gods are to blame. In just a few seconds, Berman snapped out of his pain and emitted an evil, cold, and incomprehensible voice. The sound seemed to peel away Lumian's flesh, exposing his spirit body to the perilous sunlight and the grayish-black gravel. Lumian's movements slowed, and the grotesque arms finally reached in, dragging Berman away from the area. Phew, Lumian exhaled and recovered. He didn't pursue. Instead, he gazed silently at the void ahead, raised his right hand, and snapped his fingers. Rumble. Amidst the sudden eruption of intense flames, Berman's body materialized, shattering from an explosion. Fire infusion. Hunter's fire infusion. In truth, Lumian hadn't acted rationally. His optimal strategy would have been to seize the moment when Berman's emotions and desires were ignited and strike at his vital points with the symphony of hatred, delivering a decisive blow. However, he yearned to repeatedly pummel the hidden version of himself that terrified him. With a thud, Berman's head clattered to the ground. In his daze, he caught sight of a slender figure with black hair, blue eyes, and a delicate face. It was his wife, Helen. Why you're back? Berman couldn't help but smile and extend his arm. He no longer had an arm. Gradually, he lost consciousness. Darkness enveloped his vision as if sunlight lurked deep within. Demon Warlock Berman Dead Chapter 530 Beginning Donning the silver lie earring and retrieving a white bandage, Lumian wrapped it around the burned wound on his right chest and his bloody left hand. Crimson flames surged around him, engulfing his dripping blood and splattering flesh. Throughout this process, Lumian gathered the nearby corpse fragments that Berman had scattered and piled them beside the head. He had been calculating the time. If Berman's Bayonder characteristic still hadn't materialized, he would have to move the corpse pile to the forest beside the Andatna volcano. This was because the flog boxing gloves attracted the attention of certain hidden entities, enabling them to command dangerous creatures to attack. In the past, Lumian would have had to leave the scene as soon as he finished using the flog boxing gloves, but the battle lasted only a short time. The flog boxing gloves had already been stowed into his traveler's bag, allowing him to wait a little longer. Lumian observed various colored light spots like purple, pale white and pitch black emerge from Berman's head and the scattered corpse pile. Among the items on the ground and torn clothes, Lumian found a diverse array of objects. There was a miniature brain, blood dyed and resembling brass, a retractable pitch black telescope, ointment and powder in metal canisters, a short bone scepter, a peculiar badge encircling the sun with bones, a soft cover notebook in an iron box, an ordinary-looking golden ring, and scattered gold and silver coins. 
the deposit certificates and paper cash had likely been destroyed by the explosion and the inferno. Lumian carefully stowed each item away, sensing that three possessed superpowers. Merely coming into contact with them triggered various adverse reactions. Thankfully, I had no intention of prolonging the battle with Berman from the start. Him using these mystical items later would have been troublesome. To deal with such a half-mad and resourceful enemy, I must end the battle swiftly and deny him a chance to recover. Some items were likely gathered by him, while others might have been taken from Fidel. Lumian concluded, finally picking up the dented and cracked iron box. Inside the soft cover notebook lay a blood-stained treasure map. With a brief glance, Lumian suspected it to be a sea map leading to an island in a specific sea area. It contained records of weather patterns and markings of safe sea routes. Could this be the fake treasure map sold to Berman by Mark Benito? Lumian mused. Flipping to the first page of the dark soft cover notebook, he encountered scrawled words. My mind isn't reliable all the time. I tend to forget many things. I must record all relevant knowledge and prevent them from being forgotten. Lumian refrained from delving deeper. He carefully stowed away the fake treasure map and the soft cover notebook. Lumian noticed an ordinary-looking golden ring adorning Berman's left ring finger in the corpse pile. It bore a striking resemblance to the gold rings found in the pile of spoils. They varied in size, texture, and quality. Lumian instantly grasped the situation. He removed the golden ring from Berman's finger and tied it to another golden ring with a piece of wire he had on hand. At that moment, Berman's Bayonder characteristics fully materialized, merging with parts of his corpse, resulting in two distinct items. Lumian carefully stowed away the two Bayonder characteristics, taking hold of Berman's head before vanishing from the spot. Silently, the remaining parts of Berman's body ignited, enveloping the grayish-black volcano in crimson flames. More than 200 meters away, Lumian retrieved the golden straw hat that had been blown by the strong wind. As he secured it on his head, he swiftly disappeared. This time, he appeared on the road outside the Andatna volcano's steam locomotive. Lumian glanced up at the grayish-black volcano's crater witnessing the golden-red sunset resembling flowing lava receding faster than expected. The mountaintop swiftly darkened. In the Cathedral of the Fool in Port Farum, not far from Courtier des Black Pearls, Lumian, adjusting his golden straw hat, approached the towering half-giant bishop donned in a half-top hat and black trench coat. In a deep voice, he said, I want to repent. The half-giant bishop, with light blue eyes and a towering stature exceeding two five meters, regarded Lumian for a moment before nodding. Follow me. He led Lumian into a specialized confessional, a windowless, pitch-black chamber. I don't wish to repent in the dark, Lumian calmly said, removing his golden straw hat. The half-giant bishop ignited the candles, sealing the door shut. Pa. Lumian tossed a head with pale white fur and vacant eye sockets to the half-giant bishop's feet. Did you commit murder? The half-giant bishop inquired in a mellow tone, giving the head a brief once over. No, I just want to help him repent. Lumian gestured towards the bloody head, oozing yellow pus. He's demon warlock Berman. Berman? Only then did the half-giant bishop closely inspect the head, recognizing distinct features. He fell silent for a few moments before stating, You want the church to assist you in claiming the bounty from the Intis government? As I mentioned, I'm here to repent for him. His bounty is part of his penance. Lumian's voice remained unchanged. The half-giant bishop struggled to comprehend. Lumian retrieved most of the items acquired from Berman from his traveler's bag, leaving behind the dark soft cover notebook and the fake treasure map. Clatter. These items, some endowed with superpowers, some valuable, spilled onto the ground. The half-giant bishop, sporting a top hat and trench coat, fell silent for a few seconds. The demon warlock bounty stands at 600,000 Verldor. These items hold considerable value, too. Together, they could fetch nearly one million Verl door. It's a substantial sum for anyone. Enough to ensure you don't have to take further risks. 
Are you certain about donating it to us and establishing a charity fund? Lumian didn't directly answer the half-giant bishop's question. Instead, he reiterated, This is Berman's penance. All right, since you trust our church, we'll comply with your wishes, the half-giant bishop, named Faze, said. Remember my name and feel free to monitor the charity fund's progress closely. Lumian gazed at the fool's sacred emblem in the confessional, pressed his hand to his chest, and gave a slight bow. Praise the fool. He then closed his eyes and prayed, Great Lord, I implore you to punish the world for their sins and watch over our compensation. This is an atonement, it's self-punishment. Lumian repented earnestly for a while before straightening up. He opened his eyes and turned to leave. What shall be the name of the charity fund? The half-giant bishop hurriedly inquired. Lumian took a deep breath and replied, Helen, the Helen Charity Fund. Do we need to inform the authorities about who killed Berman? The half-giant bishop cautiously asked. No need, but there's no requirement to deliberately obscure the clues for me. Lumian didn't look back. He put on his golden straw hat and exited the fool's cathedral. That night, Lumian once again entered the bar beside Sun Square known as Pelican. Batna Kumte, as usual, sat at the bar counter, sipping on golden psalm sugar wine. Beside him was a girl dressed as an adventurer with adorable facial features. Lumian walked over and joined Batna and the other patrons. He smiled and snapped his fingers at the bartender. A glass of golden psalm. Batna glanced at him and remarked, Someone's in a good mood. Indeed. Lumian received the golden syrup from the bartender and tapped the table with the bottom of the glass. Then he stood up and raised the glass. Everyone, I've encountered two things worth celebrating today. He spoke with enthusiasm and joy. The first is that I completed a commission worth more than 100,000 verl door. Impossible, Batna and the female adventurer beside him exclaimed in unison. This bounty was even higher than Black Baronet's bounty. How could it be accomplished in a day? Moreover, Batna knew that Louis Berry's employer, Fidel, was already deceased. How could he have received a new commission? Lumian continued in a passionate tone, To celebrate this, I'll treat everyone at the bar counter to a glass of golden psalm. Nearly ten adventurers and patrons expressed admiration. One of them teased, Regardless of the truth, I believe you. The others chimed in. Lumian's smile widened. Second thing to be happy about, I've woven a tale to deceive a group of fools. Suddenly, the expressions of everyone at the bar counter froze. Lumian glanced at them and continued, But it's true that drinks are on the house. The adventurers and patrons booed, expressing that if they could drink for free, they didn't mind being fools. Thus, Lumian spent 96 licks or 48 verl d'or, treating the 12 people at the bar counter to a glass of golden psalm. Observing Louis Berry, Batna silently muttered, he's genuinely happy. Late at night, aboard the Flying Bird, Room 5, First Class Cabin. Lumian returned to the barely habitable master bedroom, ignited the kerosene lamp, and retrieved the dark soft cover notebook and the fake treasure map he had obtained from demon warlock Berman from his traveler's bag.